The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. Introducing Sign Institute Fellow 2022, Julian Castro. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our fourth session of this Sign Institute series, uh, which we've titled Time to Do Things Differently, Getting Beyond Policy Silos to Boost Economic Mobility. Today is a real treat uh, because I get to interview somebody that is very, very familiar. I don't think there's a person that could be more familiar than uh, the guy that I'm about to interview. Uh, very familiar to me, looks like me. Uh, and has also been in public service now for about 20 years. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with Representative Joaquin Castro. I think that this is the first time I've actually uh, interviewed you, Joaquin, uh, on video at least. I think we did one for the podcast. Um, welcome to American University's Sign Institute and this series uh, where we've focused a lot on during these times, uh, how we can do things differently to benefit the most vulnerable Americans. I want to get to all of that uh, in a little while, but I just wanted to start off with a conversation uh, to begin with about why you got into public service in the first place. We have a lot of students watching and other folks who have thought about going into politics or some form of public service, whether it's in front of the scenes or behind the scenes. You got into politics pretty early um, elected to the Texas State House at the age of 28. Uh, you served there for 10 years and then got elected to Congress starting in January of 2013. So you're almost going to be 10 years in the Congress, 20 years of public service, but you started very young. Um, why did you get involved in politics and public service in the first place? Well, it's good to be with you, I guess. Uh, great to be with everybody at the Sign Institute and all the students and faculty and everybody else that's part of the American University uh, community. And uh, I got to say, my internet is a little bit spotty this morning. So if I freeze or something, I'll rejoin you. You'll have to ad lib for a second. Uh, it's a always a I'll little just draw weird on myself and pretend <laughs> like I'm you or something. You can give both answers. It's <laughs> yeah. always a little bit weird being interviewed by your twin brother, but you know, I'll, I'll make a go of it. Um, well, you know, I mean, we grew up in a family that was very involved in grassroots politics. Uh, our parents, uh, our parents were together till we were eight years old, but our parents met during the Mexican-American civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s in Texas and San Antonio. So you know, I grew up in a household where uh, people believed, our parents believed that the things that government does matter. And that when government works right, it can actually help create opportunity in people's lives, that it can help do good things in people's lives. Not that government was the answer to everything, but certainly when it, when it works right, that it can uh, address injustices, that it can help move people forward, that it cre can create opportunity for people. So I grew up believing that. And uh, you're right, you know, I started in politics very young, about a year after you did. I think we, we got back from law school in 2000 when we graduated. You ran for city council and I think got elected at 26. And then the following uh, fall, I want to say, I started my campaign for the state legislature. And for those folks that are interested in going into politics or working at different levels of politics, you might be wondering, how do you choose uh, state government over city government, for example, or going in interning or working in Congress because they work on slightly different things. 
Uh, and in the state legislature, I felt like I could work on issues that I really cared about. As you can imagine, or as you all know, the state legislature has uh, basically the first say on what happens in education policy, what happens in a lot of healthcare policy in a state, uh, on a lot of things in economic development. And I was representing a community on mostly the west side of San Antonio uh, that was, that's was that been economically depressed for a long time. So I wanted to run for the state legislature and got elected when I was 28 uh, in 2002. I took office in 2003 and served for some very colorful years in Texas uh, in at a time when Republicans in 2003 took over all, I think, 29 constitutional offices, state offices in Texas, and for the first time since the 1800s, took over control of both chambers of the legislature. So it was a year that was a sea change, but away from the Democratic Party and in favor of the Republican Party. And you ask why I got involved. You know, I mean, growing up when you're young, I think you're still kind of, I say young, you know, when you're, when we were growing up with our parents and listening to them and all the the arguments they were making, the debates they were having with friends about why it mattered so much to be involved in politics. Uh, for me, what I what I what I came to believe after thinking about it for a long time, really thinking about this question, why get involved in public service or why run for office versus the a lot of the other good things that you could do. You could go be a firefighter, you could be a teacher, you could be a doctor, just other careers that are incredibly worthwhile. Well, like in your case, I mean, you're uh, an attorney, right? You're a lawyer. That's right. We were, and you we have practiced law. law. Yeah, that's true. And we were practicing law because in Texas, the legislature only pays about $600 a month when you're out of session. And then when you're in session, it pays $600 a month plus a monthly stipend because you're in session and you're traveling back and forth to your district and everything. Uh, but it took me a few years to really nail down an answer that satisfied me about what the role of government is in people's lives. And I think, and the role of legislators. And I believe that the role of legislators in the United States has been to create an infrastructure of opportunity that helps people pursue their American dreams. Mm -hmm. So when you hear us debate things like uh, what it takes to create great schools and universities or a strong healthcare system or an economy that's built around well-paying jobs so that when people work hard, they can actually support themselves and support their families. If you think about what you're talking about there, you're talking about building this infrastructure of opportunity, but also, and we've seen a lot of fights over the years on this, making sure that everybody in the country has access to that infrastructure of opportunity. And so those are the things that have kind of animated and motivated me uh, to serve in office, but also to stay in office. This is my this is my 20th year. When I finish this year, it'll, it will have been 20 years in public service. So I started young in my late 20s, and you know we turned 48 this year on September 16th, and it will be 20 years now, 10 years in the state legislature, 10 years in the federal Congress. Well, and, and in those 20 years, um, you know, talk to me about what you're most proud of or the highest moment, and then what's been the lowest moment? Uh, a lot of folks, I think, wonder, for when people actually go into politics, because there's this image of it as being nasty and you got to have thick skin and it's so polarized, log jammed and so forth. But what's been the highest moment? What's been the lowest moment? You know, it's interesting. Um, I was in the deep minority in Texas in the legislature the whole time I was there. Uh, Democrats never had a majority in the state house. Uh, we were, interestingly, unlike the federal Congress, which is fairly gridlocked, and it's very tough to pass sometimes even simple pieces of legislation. In the Texas legislature, there was a much more bipartisan spirit, so you could actually pass legislation. So for example, I worked on legislation to expand uh, the benefits for veterans, higher education benefits for veterans. Uh, but one of the things that I'm most proud of was something that was actually outside of the legislative chamber, which is when I was in the state legislature, uh, I ended up creating in my office, my staff was very instrumental in this as well, creating what became the city's largest book drive and ultimately literacy campaign uh, that still you know, thrives to this day. It's called Essay Reads. Uh, but we started collecting books and giving them out to schools in San Antonio because I had seen a very troubling statistic. Now it must be you know, probably more than 15 years ago now that said that out of about the top 70 metropolitan areas in the country, 
or, or cities that San Antonio ranked something like 65th in terms of reading and literacy. Mm -hmm. And so that spurred me then to go do something, uh, to try to do something about it. And it was something that was not necessarily a law, but, but an effort, an initiative to try to change that. Uh, and I'm incredibly proud of that. And how about the low point? Uh, there's been maybe a few more of those. Um, uh, I mean, look, I was, like I said, I was in the deep minority in Texas. And um, I was there when we tried to fight off the re-redistricting or the second round of redistricting in Texas, where, where Democratic state legislators left the state to go to Oklahoma for four days. The state senators, the Democratic state senators, ended up leaving and going to New Mexico for something like 34 days, trying to stop Tom DeLay at that time and the Republican majority in the federal Congress from getting the Texas legislature to gerrymander the districts again, to completely redraw the districts. In the middle and of the decade. That's they right. I remember it. Decade. It was, it was quote unquote, mid-decade redistricting. In other words, the redistricting had already been done after the census, and they were trying to do it again because they had just gotten the majority in the legislature. And so they wanted to take advantage of that majority and redraw congressional districts and other districts as well. And so that was a low because it was, it was at 28 years old at that point, uh, it was my first encounter up close where I was part of the process, my first encounter seeing the rawness of politics. In other words, there was nothing wrong with those existing congressional districts and other legislative districts, but here you had a group of people who had the power to do something and change something because they wanted to, to increase their political power and they were willing to do it uh, through the legislative process that I was a part of. Uh, so that certainly was, was uh, I think, for me, a low point in, in, in seeing kind of the rawness of political power. Uh, and then I was um, part of the Senate impeachment team, the trial team, and the trial in 2021, February of 2021, to try to hold President uh, Donald Trump accountable uh, for the insurrection that he incited in many ways. And, you know, it was, I, I, when people asked about it back then last year, I said that, that in a sense, I was honored to do it, but it was a very solemn honor uh, because for the country, it was a low point that you would have a president who would use his office to try to incite people to or overturn the results of an election. Uh, so that was something that was not, it was not uh, happy for the uh, happy time for the country. Um, it was a very, a very somber and sobering experience. Well, I wanted to ask you a bit about that experience because you were one of something like nine, basically presenters at the impeachment trial. As a House member, you were appointed uh, by the speaker to go to the Senate and be a part of the trial and put on the evidence against President Trump in his second impeachment trial. You know, a lot of people wonder, I mean, how does that even work? Uh, walk us through that process of getting that together, the actual trial that people saw on TV. Well, I got a call, uh, I guess maybe it was on a Tuesday uh, afternoon, somewhere around five o'clock from Speaker Pelosi. And she called me and of course I saw that it was her and I you know, picked up the phone and I, she said, uh, in about an hour or so, we're going to announce the uh, impeachment managers for the Senate trial. And I want to know if you want to be part of it. And I had actually spoken to her about participating in the first one, uh, the first Senate impeachment, actually, after all the Ukraine issues, uh, had spoken to her about it, but I ended up not being part of that group and had not really thought about it since then, uh, after that first impeachment trial had concluded. And so it was genuinely a surprise that she called me and asked me to be part of the second one. And, you know, and I, I actually thought, because remember, I was chairman of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus during uh, the last two years of President Trump. I was also on the Intelligence Committee the whole time President Trump was in office. So all of the Russia investigation, all the impeach, both impeachment investigations, we were very much part of that. Uh, and I was, to be honest, I was kind of fatigued. I was kind of tired of being on those, in those two places, kind of on the front line of battling back against this president. Um, but 
so she selected the impeachment managers and Jamie Raskin, who's an incredible lawyer, had been a constitutional law professor, uh, was the lead impeachment manager. And we worked for close to a month at that point on preparing our case and dividing up the responsibility of who was going to present on each count. Uh, and it was a very, just a very thorough process, a very disciplined process. Um, well, lots of practices and lots of debate back and forth about what we should focus on and what we should include and what we shouldn't. And then there's the actual trial itself, which, you know, for a member of the House of Representatives, you, you only every once in a while you may go to the Senate. We technically have the right to go over the Senate and stay outside the rails on the floor and all that. Uh, but you really don't see House members go over that often. So, you know, to go to the United States Senate floor um, and be there and be able to present in front of the full Senate and in front of the country uh, was, was again, something was a solemn honor, um, but very intense. It was a very intense uh, four days or so. And I mean, were you, were you surprised at the result at the end? I think he got something <laughs> like, was it 57 votes for impeachment? Yeah, no, that I was, I guess I was, um, I like to be able to say that I was surprised, uh, but in the end, I, you know, I, I wasn't. Um, I was, I guess, concerned from the beginning that there wouldn't be enough Republicans who would be willing to stand up to President Trump, uh, even though many of them in the aftermath of the, of the insurrection on January 6th had made very disparaging comments about, the pres about President Trump's role in it. I was concerned that there wouldn't be enough of them that would stand up to him. Now we did get some, but in the end, uh, it wasn't enough to get the two thirds that we needed to convict in the Senate. Um, but you know, I, nonetheless, like I was very proud of of all of the work that we did, the case that we made to the American people and to the Senate. And you know, and uh, I wish that it had turned out differently, uh, but I know that we stood up for what was right. And I know that what we did was important in leaving a marker in American history and a record for American history uh, when historians will evaluate this period later on. You serve on the uh, House Intelligence Committee and also uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee. And so a lot of the work that you do is steeped in the security of our country and also our relationships with countries around the world. Of course, over the last couple of months, that's what's dominated the news and a lot of Americans' attention, the war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, I want to ask you about that in a second, but first, that wasn't your background, foreign affairs and you know, national security coming into Congress. Um, how did you adjust to that? I think a lot of folks that are thinking about a career in public service, they may wonder, well, look, you know, I've heard that you need to go to law school or you need to understand X, Y, and Z, but that's not really what I'm into. Um, I think your example shows that, uh, you know, there's a, a long and winding road, so to speak, uh, to rip off yeah. the needles. Um, talk to me about making the adjustment to focus on those issues. Well, I had had an interest, an interest in foreign affairs for a while. When I started in public service, I was on the Border and International Affairs Committee in the Texas legislature for a few terms. But in Texas, as you know, when we talk about border and international affairs, it's mostly our relationship with Mexico. So the scope of that committee in terms of foreign affairs was fairly limited because Texas, of course, is a state, it's not a nation. And, you know, so when yeah, I got- Greg Abbott seems to be treating it that way recently, right? That's true. <laughs> Yeah, but when I got to Congress, I had a choice to make, actually. I had done a lot of work in the Texas legislature um, around higher education and specifically spent a lot of time trying to get more Texas students into college and then get them to graduate because retention and completion have been a big issue at our Texas junior colleges and universities. So I, I was kind of a, at a little bit of a fork in the road about whether I was gonna continue focusing on education and higher education, or whether I was gonna you know, pursue my interest in foreign affairs. And so I actually took that direction. My first term in Congress, I got assigned to the Armed Services Committee and my district in San Antonio includes uh, part of Joint Base San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base. So there's a huge military installation 
And we have, San Antonio is known as Military City USA. We've got a lot of veterans who are here. So that Armed Services Committee was very important to my district. And then, the, and then I was assigned to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, ultimately, uh, after a few years, I would come off of the Armed Services Committee and join the Intelligence Committee. I had to roll off of one of my committees to take the intelligence assignment. And I chose to stay on Foreign Affairs and, and give up Armed Services. Um, but I'll rotate back into armed services after, because uh, we're term limited on the Intel Committee. We can only serve there for about eight years. Uh, and since then, I also picked up the Education Committee, so I've continued that work. But that's kind of how I ended up uh, pursuing my interest in foreign affairs, was I actually had to make a tough choice, which is, am I going to continue to work on education issues primarily, or am I going to actually pursue this other interest that I have? And I took that road. I mean, and how do you feel about that now, now that you've been at it's it? It's been for great. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's kept me engaged in Congress. You have to, whatever job you work at, but particularly if you're in public service, pick something that you're passionate about, an issue that you're passionate about, uh, so that, you know, you look forward to going and working and going to the committees and just doing all the work you need to do uh, to do your job well. And so it's been good. Uh, one other area of intense focus for you, especially over the last two years, has been on the issue of uh, representation in media. Uh, you've especially highlighted the lack of representation for Latinos and Latinas in Hollywood, in uh, you know, television, books, traditional media. What got you interested in that, and where are you in terms of your work there? <clears throat> when I became chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus in 2019, I decided that one of the issues that we would take on was representation of Latinos. The Latino community is the largest minority community in the United States. It's about 18.6% of the population. Uh, so closing in on almost one fifth or 20% of the population. And I decided that we would take on the issue of representation and the Latino narrative across media platforms. And uh, there's one vignette that kind of tells you or gives you a sense of this challenge better than I could describe it in words. Um, uh, we were having a meeting with the Association of American Publishers in May of 2020. And by that time it was a Zoom meeting. And we were meeting the CHC, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus was meeting with some of uh, the largest publishers in the United States and, and the CEOs of these companies. And I asked one of them, and I didn't mean it to be a trick question, but I asked him whether he could name three Latinos or Latinas who had had a significant impact in American history. I was basically asking him a question about historical figures. Can you name three Latino historical figures? And the gentleman, he thought about it. This was a very accomplished man that I had gone to one Ivy League school and another great university and was obviously very ambitious, the CEO of this huge publishing company that supplies textbooks to schools and to universities. And he thought about my question for a second. And he finally said, um, you know, no, you know, I, I, I can't, hmm. uh, that he couldn't name these three figures. And uh, he wasn't trying to be rude. He wasn't dismissing my question. We were all having an earnest discussion. And I thought about that, that to me was a crystallizing moment where I thought about the fact that the Latino narrative is so missing from the larger American narrative in the United States. And so I suspect that if you asked 80, 90% of Americans the same question that I asked of that CEO, uh, you would probably get the same answer, which is people probably can't tell you three historical figures. And that's because a few reasons. Number one, uh, the Latino story, the Latino narrative has been left out of the telling of American history by and large in US history textbooks, in state history textbooks, although some have been better than others. Uh, so it's been left out of schooling, uh, but it's also for the most part been left out of American media. And what has filled that void in narrative uh, instead are stereotypes. So Latinos as quote unquote illegals, Latinos as gangbangers, Latinos oftentimes in television and film as hypersexualized, all of these stereotypes that have defined the community instead of the positive contributions of a community to the United States. And, uh, and so my work in media over the last three years in particular 
has been an effort really to help fill that void in narrative and to help make sure that the Latino story is told not only in film and television and in streaming, but also in books, that there are more Latino and Latina authors that are published uh, and in hard news uh, and in print. Uh, and so, you know, you can imagine we met with broadcasters, with the big publishing companies, with the big magazine publishers and newspapers, uh, just everybody, the Hollywood folks, everybody talking about this challenge uh, in narrative. Uh, and I mean, it, it, it remains a big challenge. In those conversations, uh, has, has anything given you hope? Is there a particular sector or some developments that you see that um, you know, are, are starting to change that narrative or the availability yeah. of that narrative? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am hopeful. I do think that the numbers in terms of representation of Latinos and Latinas as, pub as authors, published authors, uh, as uh, people who are in front of and behind the camera on film and television projects and streaming projects, uh, all of it, those numbers are slightly improving, but they're still way under uh, where they should be. You know, they're probably like at six, seven percent now. And again, the Latino population is like 18.6 percent of the United States. So there's still a long way to go um, to make sure that this community's voice and this community's narrative uh, is heard and is told. And by the way, the reason that's so important, it's not just a matter of, you know, which actor or actress gets a role in some Hollywood film. A big reason that narrative is important is because if you're, as a community, if your narrative and the positive contributions and the importance of your community to the country are not told, then you get defined by something else. And that something else often is stereotypical and then those stereotypes, particularly over the last several years, although it's happened before in American history, uh, those stereotypes are then taken by people in politics and again, twisted for their own political purposes. And in the end, I think what you get in the most dangerous examples of that are what happened in El Paso, Texas in August of 2019, where this guy drives 10 hours to kill more than 20 people because he considers them quote unquote Hispanic invaders to Texas. Mm -hmm. Now, where did that guy get that idea? Uh, he didn't grow up on the border among uh, Mexican immigrants. Uh, he got that idea historically, I think from media stereotypes. And then in 2019, from the very heated political rhetoric of the time, uh, and, and just before that, President Trump's campaign had purchased 2000 Facebook ads talking about an immigrant invasion to the United States. You know, so there is a real cost to communities when their story is not included in American history and in American media. And then the last part of that is that uh, I also think that it's not just an issue for Latinos. That problem also, or that challenge and that problem apply to other American communities as well. Uh, the Muslim American community is another example where that's true. Um, historically, the African American community, of course, uh, and also the Asian American community over the last few years that has faced a wave of ugly hate crimes, I think also in some measures uh, are facing that same challenge of being defined by these stereotypes and disinformation uh, and then having to fight that off you know, in media. Well, how would you like the broader Latino, Latina community to be defined? Uh, I, I, I would hope that uh, the contributions that we've made to the, to a, to the country um, would be celebrated, um, whether it's in culture, in arts, in music, in business, in science, and all of these things where folks from the Latino community have made very positive contributions to the development of the United States, I hope that those folks would be uplifted as examples of American heroes and pioneers and people that should be celebrated. Um, you know, that's why it's also very concerning this move uh, against including the stories of minority communities in history textbooks, for example, mm -hmm. and in the teachings in public schools. Uh, it's very distressing because, like I said, I, I believe there's a danger in that. There's a danger in whitewashing that history, and there's a danger in not telling about the positive contributions of different communities. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here uh, to drill down into the focus of our 
uh, seminar series, um, we've focused a lot in these conversations on uh, how we can make sure that during this time, when we've just been in the middle of a pandemic, uh, people have felt the sting of an economic recession, uh, our politics are very polarized, um, and yet we've also seen during the pandemic the way that the most vulnerable in the country have been the hardest hit. Uh, and the fact that our minimum wage hasn't gone up since 2009, and in many states, their worker protection laws are still uh, subpar. Um, uh, the skyrocketing cost of housing that's affordable to lower income folks and to the middle class. So given all of that, uh, I guess the best place to start is you have a few months left until the elections and then until January of 2023. Um, we don't know for sure what's gonna happen in the midterms, but historically in the midterms, uh, the incumbent president's party, in this case, the Democrats, lose over two dozen seats. And at least if we look at the polling right now, uh, although of course I hope that this isn't the case, it looks like Republicans are gonna take control at least of the House of Representatives and, and perhaps of the United States Senate, making it very difficult to get anything done with respect to investing in the neediest among us. So there's been talk of trying to do build back better in a piecemeal way. What are some of the things that, that have already been done during President Biden's term and then perhaps you might be able to do piecemeal uh, in a limited way uh, that you're excited about that can benefit uh, the neediest Americans? Well, if you think about where President Biden started, uh, he started with a country that, and not to say the pandemic is over because people are still getting infected and there's still people dying, in fact, from this pandemic, but when there were more people infected and more people dying, certainly when he took office, uh, he was still facing a country where uh, the overwhelming majority of people had not received any vaccination at all, never mind going out to work, uh, people that were in the middle of losing loved ones, uh, an economy that was still wrecked, um, and uh, folks that were still jobs, uh, brought the un unemployment level down to a historic low. Yeah, so there are a lot of achievements around the economy and helping the country bounce back that President Biden rightly deserves credit for and that Democrats can celebrate and I think talk to the American people about. Uh, so those are good things. And I'll just give you one example on the child tax credit uh, and how valuable that has been. And the fact that when it was implemented under President Biden, um, that it it cut the child poverty rate in half. Uh, just the amazing effect of being able to cut child poverty that drastically. And so when you talk about, when people talk about the difference between one party being in control or the other party being in control, and you think about the practical stakes for people, uh, that's a very clear example where uh, if you've got that child tax credit in place, that expanded child tax credit, then you're talking about the difference between uh, you know, millions of people being able to live above the poverty line or millions of people falling back below the poverty line, that that's what's at stake. Uh, and that's just one example. But in terms of other great things that have been done so far that will provide an economic boost to the country, the infrastructure bill, of course, was a big one uh, because that, that'll be a shot in the arm in terms of jobs, uh, but also, because in communities, uh, you still see a lot, you see roads and bridges and uh, other uh, transportation projects that need such incredible resources to get done. Um, and so, you know, thankfully, President Biden and the Congress, we were able to get that done. Uh, but you mentioned Build Back Better. That's something that we thought started as a $3 trillion project and then slowly went down. Um, and included important things, would have included important things like uh, voting rights reform, right? Uh, making sure that voting rights were protected 
in an era where gerrymandering has become out of control and voter suppression is, is now out of control. Um, and, you know, and so that obviously didn't get done. Uh, and that, that is a hit to American democracy. And so there's still a lot of work, hopefully, that we can get done. Uh, but because Democrats' margins are so thin in both the House, but especially in the Senate, it's got to be something where you get all 50 Democratic senators to sign off on. Uh, and as everybody knows, that's been a real challenge on these larger pieces of legislation, with the exception of the infrastructure bill and, of course, the omnibus that we just passed not too long ago, uh, which was also very great for the country. Uh, but in terms of voting rights and criminal justice reform and some of the other immigration reform, some of the other very important issues that Democrats talked about and campaigned on in 2020 that still haven't gotten done, unless you can wrap up every single vote among Democrats in the Senate. And then again, on some of these, you need to get over the filibuster if you're not gonna re remove it. You know, I think that we should get rid of the filibuster, um, but that's what makes it challenging still. In about four minutes, I'm gonna turn it over to our student associates, uh, Jeremy and Olivia. And Jeremy's gonna ask questions or questions that students have submitted. Uh, if folks have questions, they can submit those as well uh, in the chat. Uh, but first, um, your district, the 20th Congressional District of Texas, covers about half of San Antonio and also a couple of the suburbs on the west, northwest side. Um, and like a lot of different congressional districts, it runs the gamut in terms of affluence from folks who are pretty affluent to um, people who are uh, low income and for generations have lived in places like the west side of San Antonio with subpar schools, subpar infrastructure, um, and oftentimes, too oftentimes, their destiny is determined by the zip code that they're growing up in, in this case, 78207 being one of them. Um, so when you think about your own district and what you'd like to see for the residents of the 20th Congressional District uh, and their needs, what do you think about first? Well, you're right. I have a district that is what I would consider a bread and butter district, a uh, district of people who are um, mostly humble, hardworking people who actually, I think, don't ask a lot from government. Uh, but I think they want an opportunity to succeed in life and they want an even better opportunity for their kids and their grandkids. And that, I think, is the baseline for most people. And when I talked about this infrastructure of opportunity, when I, when I thought about that, I was thinking about the people that I represent and have represented now for 20 years, is when you think about the fundamentals about making sure you have great schools and universities, that means that college is affordable for folks that want to pursue higher education, that it's accessible, um, in other words, that it's not out of reach, that if somebody says, I want to be a nurse or I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, whatever it is, that they actually have a path to get there. Uh, and so you know, right now on both ends, making college more affordable, expanding Pell Grants, but then on the other end, for giving student loans, because there's so many people who are buried in a mountain of student loan debt, right? Those are important issues. And then uh, building or a healthcare system that is, that strives or moves towards universal health care coverage yeah you know, we grew up in a family where you know our grandmother was diabetic and she was always at the public hospital when we were young we would wait there with her uh for her for her appointments and you have so many families in the district that i represent who have trouble affording their diabetes medication that's why the 35 dollars a month cap on diabetes medication is important uh, that's why allowing the federal government to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies on uh, pricing, on drug pricing, is an important piece of legislation so that you can lower the cost for people. It's why moving towards uh, universal health care coverage, whether it's Medicare for all or something else, is important because there's still a lot of people that just don't have health care coverage and they're not seeing the doctor until they end up in the emergency room. Uh, and then the economy that's built around well-paying jobs uh, you know, the minimum wage hadn't been raised. The federal minimum wage, as you know, hadn't been wait, raised since 2009. And over the years, I kept jumping on the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and others 
who were fighting, even if you wanted to raise the minimum wage by a penny, they were fighting you raising the minimum wage by a penny. Uh, that I think has contributed to some of the inflation that you see now is that for so long, uh, there were folks that were bottling up wages that when the, when wages start to move up a bit, then, you know, then it, uh, employers, it, it throws some employers off because they're moving faster than the employers obviously are comfortable with. But part of the problem is that you didn't move them up for a long time. Sure. You know, and so making sure that people are able to work at well-paying jobs so that they can support themselves and their family members. So all of those things, you know, every time I'm working on something, I try to go back to those fundamental things that the people in my district, you know, care about. All right, with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeremy and Olivia who have uh, some questions that our students submitted, all right? All right, thank you so much. I really truly enjoyed the conversation that y'all had. Um, this first question is actually directed to both you, Secretary Castro, and you, Congressman Castro. Um, and it is, how do you confront one-on-one -on -one misinformation by a colleague, um, especially dangerous misinformation, not just dangerous opinions? Is there any hope in turning that person around if you give your one-on-one -on -one attention to him or her? Is If there is hope, how do you go about that? That's a great question. And, you know, I talked a little earlier about my work in media, but one of the other very deep chat, deep and growing challenges in media, particularly in social media, is misinformation and disinformation. And it's especially bad in foreign languages. So in Spanish language media, for example, in the United States, but it's also bad in English. You know, we just have a little bit better system of catching it and patrolling it in English. But to answer your question, how you deal with a colleague who may be misled by misinformation, that's, that's where the importance of your personal relationships really comes into, into play, whether you're in Congress or just uh, or you're out on a university campus in the dorm somewhere, for example, having a conversation, uh, is that you really have to be able to talk to people, relate to them as, as, an, as a friend, hopefully, uh, as somebody they trust, and to help overcome that misinformation. And I'll tell you, it's getting tougher because of the saturation of conspiracy theories, of just bad information, because sometimes people uh, don't differentiate in terms of the sources of information and where it's coming from. Uh, you know, in other words, sometimes people think that information that comes from this one, this one man website is just as valuable as something that comes from, you know, a trusted and reliable news source. And so I would say you have to fall back on your personal relationships, be armed with facts, uh, but, but also, you know, lean on those relationships to try to combat this information. Yeah, I would only add, I think those in the legislative session, especially those relationships are crucial. Um, I also feel like we're in a time where uh, this disinformation by colleagues, if it's done by one of your colleagues, has to be called out more. You know, I was inspired like a lot of people by the comments of State Senator Mallory McMorrow. Folks haven't caught him last night, today uh, on Twitter. I'm sure you can find him. She's also been on some of the cable news shows for calling out her colleague very forthrightly for running an ad that wrapped her up in this idea, uh, you know, this bogus idea that somehow Democrats are grooming kids uh, for pedophilia and other things. You have to call it out. Uh, you can't back down from it. And you have to let the truth be known with in every forum that you can in social media, um, you know, in, in other ways, and also in the chamber, the legislative chamber. I mean, look what's happened with her and how viral it's gone. And so it's sort of an all hands on deck approach because the level of misinformation and disinformation has become so toxic to the normal functioning of our democracy as January 6th showed us uh, and all of these voter suppression bills have shown us. So there's an urgency to this. 
All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, this next question comes from Christian, um, who is a public affairs student here at American University, but calls San Antonio, Texas his home. Um, he first wanted to say thank you for all of the service that, is, that both of you um, have committed to the place where he calls home. Um, and his question is, what words of advice do you have for the next generation of Latino public servants that you and many others have paved the way, the path for? How do we make sure our voices are heard at a legislative level, especially in Texas? Uh, well, I would first say that I hope that some of you um, have an interest in public service and serving in elective office, whether it's in Congress or school board, whatever it may be. Uh, I still think that it's a, a noble profession. Uh, again, I still believe that when government works right, that it can help create great opportunities in people's lives. Uh, so I hope that you'll pursue that. Um, and then also for people who don't necessarily want to run for office, but want to be involved in politics and public service, whether it's working for you know, a member of Congress or being part of any kind of movement that's important to you, uh, I would say to those of you who fit in that category, remember that some of the most important and powerful figures in American history never held elective office. Martin Luther King Jr., for example, was never a mayor or a congressman or a senator or anything. Uh, and so you can make incredible change uh, even if you never step into a legislative chamber in your life as an elected official. Uh, but for the next generation of Latino leaders, uh, what I wish for you is that if you have an interest that you'll put yourself out there. And if you want to do it when you're young, I encourage you to. Uh, Julian started running for, for city council, I think, when he was 25. And I started running for state rep when I was 26 or 27. And don't let anybody tell you that your voice is worth less just because you're young. Uh, having served now in public bodies for 20 years, uh, I have served with people that are in their mid-20s to people that are in their 90s, I think, or at least late 80s. Um, and so there is room for everyone's perspective in that body. And as a young person, you have a very important voice to share. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, when y'all do enter public service, if it's in five years or 10 years or wherever, whenever it may be, that our state will be a state whose politics are different than they are now. Uh, it'll be a state that will be able to create opportunity for everybody uh, rather than stunting opportunity. Um, and that it, will, that it will be a place really that celebrates people of all backgrounds. Uh, and so that's what I hope and that's what I wish for y'all. Our next question deals with polarization and the effectiveness um, of implementing policy. Um, and the question simply is, with ongoing and permeating polarization, how do you work between aisles to implement an effective policy agenda? That's a great question. And, you know, interestingly, there are a lot of things in Congress um, that are not in the headlines, uh, that don't dominate the news where Republicans and Democrats uh, actually work together on different issues. And I'll give you just one example of this with myself. Uh, I worked on a pro-democracy bill, a global democracy bill, because I'm on the Ford Affairs Committee, with Mark Meadows, who was uh, at one point head of uh, the Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives and then became President Trump's chief of staff. He and I had a bill together that we passed through the House of Representatives a few years ago, maybe three years ago now, uh, just before he left to become chief of staff for President Trump. And so that was an example that you would look at two people and say their politics are, you know, quite opposite and, and, and you know, bipolar. Uh, but we were able to work and, and find common ground on legislation and able to pass it through the House. The Senate is often another story just because of how they work. Um, but that's going on every day in Congress. Uh, but when you talk about a lot of the, the, the large issues that, that are often debated on cable news and in our public discourse, that's where you have a lot of gridlock and where it becomes very hard to find and increasingly harder to find agreement uh, between the two parties. And so if you ask, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of, just a lot of negotiation and a lot of patience. 
Uh, I've come to believe after 20 years now, or let me just say my congressional service, Congress in particular, the Texas legislature was a little bit different back then. But, you know, if you ask me what kind of person should go and serve in Congress, uh, I would say most of all, uh, besides all the other qualities of having passion and everything, fundamentally, I think you have to be patient and you have to be persistent. Uh, if, if you have, if, if you take stock of yourself and you feel like those are not two qualities <laughs> that you really possess or that are your strengths, then I don't know if you should go to a place like Congress because it's a very slow place and where there's a lot of frustrations because of you know, the, the gridlock and because of the hyper-partisanship. And then it's a place where you not need a lot of persist persistence because you got to convince a lot of other people to go along with your idea. And uh, if you're in the minority party, for example, what, like I was for six, the first 16 years of my public service, you, you can't use numbers to run over people. In other words, you can't just outvote the other side and say, well, we've got the majority. And so we're just going to outvote you and we're going to pass what we want to pass. Uh, and in Congress, to be honest, I'm finding out even when you've got the majority on your side, it's not a cakewalk to do a lot of the things that you want to do. Uh, but when you're in the minority, that's where you really need those that patience, that persistence, reaching out to people, developing personal relationships, uh, sometimes selling something on, on their terms because you have to convince people that don't necessarily agree with you. Uh, but it's, it's all of those things. No, definitely. Um, I know like in the past, like, and I've had professors that have said like politics is really local. Um, and I think that, especially I guess congressional races, it's kind of moved away from being about the district per se, but how that election impacts everyone else. Um, so do you think that the increasing of the federalization of politics and more of a spotlight on national politics, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? No, man, that is a tough question. I do think that politics has become more nationalized over the years. So in other words, um, if Democrats, for example, are having a tough year in 2022, or Republicans are having a, a tough year in the 2018 midterms because of national politics or how the president is perceived or so forth, that affects down ballot candidates. So it affects people who are running for office in Texas or Florida or California or wherever, Maryland. Um, yeah, so there's definitely this nationalization of politics that's intensified over the years. Uh, yeah, and you ask the question, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I mean, from the sense of somebody that runs for office, I think ultimately you wanna be judged and you want your candidacy to be judged on what you stand for and the issues that you put out there and the positions that you take. So, you know, uh, you know, in, in other words, if you asked a candidate without telling them, is it going to be a good year for your party or a bad year? So uh, a priori, right? Like, what would you prefer? I think somebody would prefer to just stand on their own. Um, you know, so that's so that it affects that. Now, is it is it uh, good or bad in terms of the issues? Uh, there is some good to it. The good to it, I think, is that people at every level of government whether it's state, local, federal, and the voters are now aware of a set of national issues that are important to the country. I think that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. But all of the, all of the fighting and all of the acrimony and everything that's associated with that and this wave effect that we're seeing more often now where one party wins and they sweep everybody out. And, and just the last point to, to put a, a bow, a, a ribbon on this, um, you know, for about from the 1950s to about 1994, Democrats controlled Congress. They controlled both chambers of Congress. And then from the mid 1990s to about 2006, 2008, uh, Republicans controlled Congress. And then from about 2006, 2008 uh, to, or, you know, I'm sorry, Republicans controlled and then Democrats controlled for a few years, a shorter period of time and then Republicans controlled for a short period of time. So these, what I'm saying is that these periods where one party controls Congress seem to be getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And these wave elections are coming more often, which tells me that among other things, politics has just become more national. Uh, and it's, it's a reality in our world today. 
in the news lately, there's definitely been um, conversations about the Democratic Party's bills have been passed, signed into law by President Biden, and the disconnect that, that seems to happen um, with voters. Um, so the question that we have is, low-income Americans in the middle of the country, who are mostly white, feel alienated by the Democratic Party's messaging. How do we fix this? I think that you have to go and very strategically um, basically tell the story of what Democrats have done. Tell the story that Joe Biden has brought unemployment down to a historic low, has created millions and millions of jobs with the fastest job growth that we've seen. Uh, so, that, so that when you're talking about the issues of economic security, for example, people are wondering, uh, whether they're going to be able to bounce back from the pandemic, whether they're going to be okay, and their family is going to be okay, that that the president and the Democratic Congress have done something about that. You know, now what you see, what the headwind that you face, aside from the historical headwind where where the president's party usually gets popped in the midterms, is that really Republicans are 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 playing so to so to speak or messaging on a completely different level and a different thing. Uh, a lot of what they're messaging on are, are uh, a, basically a set of cultural issues, uh, whether it's going after trans kids, for example, or certain library books, or the idea that critical race theory is being taught in public schools across America. Uh, you know, things, some things that just are flat out untrue, other things that have a kernel of truth, but are then embellished, right? And then I'm not gonna say that every single thing that they say is not true, right? There are things, of course, messages that they put out there that are true. Um, but a lot of it centers around creating resentment among voters and among Americans and turning Americans against each other. Um, and so you have to, I mean, look, if the issue is economic security, then President Biden has done a pretty good job about, of that. And the Democratic Congress has done a pretty good job of that when the un unemployment rate is very low and uh, you know, and the vaccination rate in terms of protecting yourself against COVID is pretty good. You know, it could be better, but it's pretty good. Um, you know, now in terms of these other cultural issues, uh, you know, that that is what is animating a lot of the political right at this time and what they're trying to get, how they're trying to motivate voters. Again, with all this discussion about grooming and pedophilia and all of these fantastical conspiratorial things. Uh, but that said, those messages can be very powerful. Um, you know, and then by the way, uh, the issue of inflation is a real issue. And it's, and it's something that, you know, that the president has been working on and Democrats have been working to combat. Um, you know, rising gas prices are a real issue. Part of that is the war that Vladimir Putin started, uh, the invasion that he promulgated against Ukraine, right? Uh, but those are those are things that that we do have to work on. Our final question um, due to time uh, is how do you balance constituent concerns versus federal concerns if they're at odds with each other in Congress? Huh, that's a great question. Most of the time, they're pretty consistent. Um, you know, I'll say like we just went to Texas, just like every other state, just went through a round of redistricting, redrawing of the maps. In Texas, most of the Democratic districts, except for one, got packed, right? So in other words, Republicans, in order to create more districts, congressional districts that are Republican, they put more Democrats in the Democratic districts. So my district went from being about 64% or, well, low 60s Democratic now to, let's say, mid 60s or probably 66% uh, Democrat or something. You know, so they made it even more democratic. So what I mean to say is usually where I am is usually consistent with, with where the majority of people in my district are. So it isn't, isn't that often that we're out of alignment. Um, but every once in a while, um, you know, I'll feel like, hey, I've got to I've got to think about or I've got to balance out. Like there are a lot of people in my district, you know, a majority or greater who maybe uh, might not agree with my position on this or you know, might want me to vote the other way. Uh, and then it, it becomes a real soul searching, uh, you know, process that you go through in deciding which way you're going to go, right? Because ultimately you were elected to represent the district, 
but you're always you also have to be mindful of, of what the people of the district, the majority of the people of the district actually want. All right, well, Jeremy, first of all, thank you so much uh, for conducting that Q&A and to Olivia, our other student associate as well. Uh, I wanna thank uh, everybody on the staff of the Sign Institute, especially Charles Leggett and Amy Dacey. Uh, and uh, Joaquin, thank you for joining us for this great conversation over the last hour. Um, you're gonna mark, as we mentioned earlier, 20 years soon in public service, yeah. which a long, long, long time. But before that, maybe most importantly, uh, you and Anna, uh, your wife, are going to welcome your third child uh, in early May. So congratulations. And thank, thank you, you for your public service. Thank everybody for joining us. Uh, don't miss the final uh, session of this series next Wednesday on April 27th. We're going to do it at a little bit of a different time. Instead of 1 o'clock Eastern, it's going to be at 3 o'clock Eastern. And it'll be with Ayana Presley. Join us next Wednesday. Take care. Take care, y'all.